Arlington has a new museum that celebrates an all but ignored history. If you have talent, guarding POTUS can be an artful experience. And we go to where illusions call home. It's Black History Month, and we give thanks to all the known and unknown pioneers that have been a part of America's important history. We got a great show. Let's go. Hey, I'm Morgan Wood, and you're watching Artico on WHUT. Today, we're at the Museum of Illusions, right here in Center City, Northwest DC. And we're gonna learn about the art of the illusion. I'm super excited, and I'm ready to have some fun, so why don't you guys come on and join me? Hey, I'm Morgan Wood. I'm at the Museum of Illusions, and I have the pleasure of speaking with the director of Illusions, the director of the muse museum, Gita. Gita, thanks for joining me today. Good morning, Morgan. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. I mean, my head is a little tight, you know? <laughs> it's a little blown from some of the illusions that I've seen. So talk to me about the art of the illusion. Yeah, so we have uh, over 50 illusions. Some are interactive, some are immersive, some are visual. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do at, at the Museum of Illusions is have you experience the illusion and are all based on, um, on, uh, on basically the intersection of education and entertainment and, and where magic meets science and you and come out with art, basically. Nice. And this is the art of illusion. There, are, there is the use of mirrors, the use of angles, um, the use of science, technology, engineering, and physics that come together to really give you a masterpiece. So I was going to ask you, uh, what are some elements that make up a great illusion? I see mirrors is one. Yes. What would you say some of the other? Yeah, so we love to use mirrors and illusions. We love to use angles and the explanation of angles that um, the direction with which you see something um, it really kind of makes all the difference on whether the illusion pops out or not. It is all about really the relationship between your eye and your mind mm -hmm. and how your eye as the lens um, and your mind as a processor are working together to really sh give you the art of illusion. Nice. So talk to me about this space. Um, how long have you guys been open? So we've been open for less than a month um, and we're here to stay. We're hopefully part of the DC community. We worked really hard on curating the space, really customizing it. You'll notice everything was um, designed from, uh, from, a, from a, a very modern perspective, including the light, the light fixtures to go with the kind of uh, the feel and the vibe of the museum. We really drew on historical references of DC to make it local and to make it relevant. You'll notice George Washington's eyes following you. Um, you'll see Abraham Lincoln kind of welcoming you to the bathroom. Um, Einstein, uh, in our infinity room, we have a stars and stripes ceiling. So uh, we have a reverse room, that's the DC Metro. So it is, um, it is, illusion but it's also very DC. We are welcoming all kids from the age of three to 103 yeah. uh, and and the reason that we say kids is because this is a museum and an art gallery where you have to touch, you have to experience, you have to feel it, you have to actually go into the exhibit and right. immerse yourself. So this is a real immersive um, immersive art and illusion. <laughs> what would you say uh, the kids from three to 103 take away from this experience? Yeah. So this is all about intersection here, right? So when you're at the intersection of education and entertainment, the intersection of magic and science, the intersection of art and entertainment, um, you really are coming out with a good time but a better understanding of how optical illusions work and how you're navigating from your right brain to your left brain and what the association from your eye to your brains are so you have a great understanding about what makes an illusion but you've actually experienced it and not just seen it well Gita let me get a little bit into your business what inspired you to get into this type of work were you like fascinated by these puzzles I mean did you have trouble solving some things? <laughs> we have a lot of amazing kind of I, I call it yoga for the brain you know these these puzzles that really challenge your mind like this one right here the Hanoi Tower um, and they they make you think they, they also make you use 
uh, reasoning and analysis, physics, different things. And, and, and what I liked is really, it was a space that I could come in with my family, whether that, or my friends, or my significant other. Right. And, and each time you experience it, you experience it a little bit different, depending on who you're with. And I think that's what really inspired me to bring it. Every time we go to a museum and we're not short of any in DC, um, we say don't touch. And here we say, touch, yeah, get go involved. in, get involved in yeah. that. And what you put in is what you get out here. Nice. We're standing in front of one of the f most fun exhibits, um, right Morgan. Yeah, this is called the Head on a Platter. Okay. Do you want to give it a? Can I go ahead? Do you want to give it a try? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's come back. Come back through here. I right? promise if there's a body there attached is. to this <laughs> guy. Based on, again, the use of mirrors and the use of angles. When you stand right here, it looks like a table that has legs and that your bottom of, the, of your body disappears. This is our infinity well. So if you look down here, it looks like it goes on forever. And if you look up, it looks like it goes on forever. But the truth is, this is no more than a box. Oh, okay. And, the, and what I like to say is we've got the use of some CSI Miami mirrors going on here. So we've sandwiched the use of physics with a few mirrors, and you can step on there. And then, yeah. <laughs> but like you said, it's just a box. It's just a box. It's no more than this. And what our, what our, our, our guests like to do here is strike a pose, reverse the picture upside down, because this place is all about getting photographed. And you guys make sure that you uh, check out some of my photos. I'm going to share it. Hashtag Museum Illusion. And then this is the room that I like to call our rainbow technology. Uh, our 14 year olds like to call it our TikTok room. Ah, <laughs> because, I can see why. Yes, um, there's a lot of great videos that are made in here. I'm Morgan Wood. We're here at the Museum of Illusions, and I'm standing here with Janae. She works here. And I have been tinkering with this one puzzle. There's all kinds of illusion, brain game puzzles going on in here, and I've been tinkering with this one. It's supposed to end up in a cube like this but uh yeah i've been having some trouble she's a genius at this so she's been able to put together three different puzzles while i'm still struggling so can you show us how you did okay these puzzles? so first i'm going to start with the egg puzzle um basically it's a 3d puzzle um it comes with nine wooden pieces and what I'll do is put it together, so... So, as I told you with this one... And you got it right back together like that? <laughs> yes. All while she was talking to us guys. And that is the egg puzzle. Wow. <laughs> this one, we didn't get a chance to try this one. Okay, this, what's that one called? This is the tea time puzzle. Tea time. Only four pieces. Okay. But you have to make the capital, the letter a capital T. The, a capital T? A capital T. With only four pieces. With only four pieces. I love like watching people struggle with this one because it's like only four pieces and when they see me do it, it's like really like that's all I had to do. Like all right, right. show me up then, Janae. Come all right. On. So she is getting really good at it. So um, wow. Yeah, who knows to put that with that? Wow, look at that. <laughs> so let's turn it around for the camera. Oh, see, I messed up the tea, but now there you go. How fascinating. Yeah, you're a genius. <laughs> you're a genius. So, Museum of Illusions, not just here to, uh, you know, play around, but I guess you actually stimulate your brain and you learn yeah. new things and you unlock secrets within yourself. So, this is just super fascinating. Thank you, Gita. Thank you, Janae, for such a wonderful experience today. You're I enjoyed welcome. it. Yes, I did as well.
We now go behind the scenes of two retired D.C. police officers, Mark and Kimberly Robinson, as they revealed to us moments they were able to capture through photography while working for the Metropolitan Police Department. We met through a friend, uh, one of Mark's best friends, Charles Satcher, and it was love at first sight. Uh, I think we were like, uh, what, 18? 18, something like that? 19, I don't know. Somewhere yeah, around. yeah, and then it grew. Um, we got married, had a good relationship. We enjoyed some of the same things, uh, specifically a lot of um, outside activities like athleticism, like running and Jogging. biking and all that. We found that we liked the outdoors a lot. We ended up um, getting married. We joined the police department and had four children. Becoming a police officer, I actually started first. Um, I started out in Fairfax County. I went out there in 1987, and Kim was in school, she was at Howard. And I actually stayed out there for three years, and I would come home and talk to Kim about, you know, the events that would happen, you know, mm -hmm. during the tour of duty, and that, that sparked her interest. And mm -hmm. so she joined, you know, the Metropolitan Police Department in March of 1990, actually a month before me. <laughs> so we were in academy together, yeah. mm -hmm. married. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One year, we have been married for one year. Yes. Yep. So MK Photography is a combination of Mark and Kim. So that's where we get the MK from. And it started, we started shooting probably 2008 professionally. And it's because we were taking pictures all the time. But, yes. you know, that's when we got serious about, you know, Photography, we both had a passion for it, and we just took an interest to make it professional, you know, and started investing in equipment, lighting, and studying and understanding, you know, uh, what good photography is. I did a lot, you know, on the department. I actually stayed 32 years, so I just retired in May uh, 2022, and um, I really especially enjoy being in special events, mm -hmm. and that's when I was able to put my photography to use as well mm -hmm. to enjoy that experience while I was at work. So I had a friend of mine that worked with me named Darren Edwards. And Darren Edwards had been into photography since probably he was 12 years old. And he and I would talk at work and he kind of exposed me to, you know, some, some what I call now professional gear. And I started taking pictures, I really started at work just mm -hmm. taking pictures, mm -hmm. you know, and then I would come home and practice, you know, Kim and I would come up, go out and shoot, and we would go to the parks, and we would walk some of the trails and shoot some of the nature pictures, mm -hmm. and I actually started liking it, and said, you know what, I think we could do this. <laughs> and so, therefore, MK Photography was birthed. Well, when he came to me, I'm not gonna lie, the, the, the money, I was saying, hey, these things are thousands of dollars. This is a lot of money. We got to slow down a little bit. So the money part, honestly, was like, wow. But the quality, it's a total, it's a big difference. So I understood that. I'm glad that we're doing it now. And it's, it's like an outlet as well. It's therapeutic, just taking pictures. And then when you get to see them and you get to edit and you can change the colors of different things, the lighting, I, I love, I love it. Well, being an SOD, Special Events Branch of Metro, Metropolitan Police Department, allowed me to be in positions that, you know, I guess normal people will not privy to. Uh, and I was able to see some of some things that I thought was just unique. One, the presidential uh, helicopter, which is Marine One, to see it up close and right in your face. And the Marines is looking so sharp. And, you see the president of the United States getting off, you know, getting off the uh, helicopter and going into the White House. I'm actually on the White House lawn. So I said, mm -hmm. you know what? This is, for me, historical. And I yeah. wanted to start capturing some of these photos, more so for uh, my scrapbook, because I started, I started late. Lord, if I had been, been in photography in mm -hmm. 1990, think of all the photos we would have had. Yeah. But I seized the moment. And so I was able to take some great photos of President Obama, President Biden, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, you know, because, you know, the inauguration, the last inauguration, a little bit different, 
you know, than the one, than the other ones before, but I was in those positions and able to just capture those moments in between uh, the motorcade, you know, keeping it professional, uh, still maintaining the security levels, but just happen, happen to capture those moments. And some of the moments I would tell you about is, one, being at the White House, watching Obama, you know, mm -hmm. President Obama get off the uh, helicopter, and uh, being at uh, um, mm -hmm. Andrews Air Force Base. Um, watching him, you know, go in and off and able to take pictures of Air Force One just to see it, you know, up front, live, in person, take off, just to be able to capture those moments was special to me. And, and also being, you know, uh, watching President Trump and Obama literally walking from the Capitol to Marine One. And that's a picture you're never ever gonna see again. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to capture that moment. And I was right there and I could tell my grandkids, you know, hey, I was there when President Obama left, his last ride, I was able to capture that moment for a lifetime. And that's what, you know, excited, you know, Kim and I about taking photos, mm -hmm. you know? So I wanted to capture that history, you know, and also go into the commercial side of it. What I want people to see through MK Photography Lens is the quality that we're able to capture. Their special moments. And so these are special moments to uh, the persons that are getting married. And so we want to capture every moment from behind the scene, from the bride and the groom getting dressed. Uh, actually, we love doing the engagement photos even before that. Just so that the person can see their beauty at that moment in time. Just at that moment in time, whether it's black or white, whether it's color, whether it's, you know, with the effects or what have you, just that moment in time because it's gone. It's gone. So, you know, we're gonna get older. If it's a kid, the two, three years old, they get to see themselves close up and then they'll have that as a memory. That's like priceless to me. I believe that I want that person to uh, receive when they see their picture from me. Hey, I'm Anwar with Artico, and today we're at the Black Heritage Museum of Arlington, and we're with the president, Dr. Scott Edwin Taylor. And uh, we just want to know how he got everything going. This history was not taught to us, and I'm, I'm an Arlingtonian. I've been here all my life. Okay. And it's a lot of things here that I didn't know growing up. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's just a, come a point in my life where somebody has to be a voice for these people. Yes, for sure. Why not me? So uh, the museum has been in existence uh, since 95, uh, but it was uh, virtual. Okay. But the, uh, the founder did want to have artifacts, um, uh, but just didn't have any. And then when I was asked to come on the board, um, I started collecting things. So what you see is a lot of stuff that I've collected um, over the years. And so you, you have to start with the Arlington House. Okay. And um, the Arlington House is where um, uh, I think our history really begins. Um, because on that property was Freedman's Village. Mm -hmm. uh, and out of Freedman's Village uh, were a lot of ex-slaves that learned how to read and write. And they began to buy property in Arlington. And Arlington was once 75% uh, black. Wow, And um, So <laughs> the black people basically are, are still the heart and soul of Arlington. That was the beginning. Fred Frederick Douglass wrote, <laughs> The nation's future is only secure when it's the nation is truthful, honest, and virtuous. And in a nation that's come a long, long way, and in Virginia has come a long way. Remember, we were both capitals of the Confederacy, Richmond and Danville. Lee's army was called the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, the Northern Virginia I grew up in still have poll taxes, literacy tests, separate bathrooms, and water fountains. Only white kids could go to the Echo, and then later only black kids could go to the Echo. <laughs> and, and we still have, um, across this country, you know, dog whistles de deriving racial elections, and the repression of votes as a way to win elections. And it's so incredibly important that we remember our history, that 
we celebrate it, that we elevate it, that, that we can only move forward if we're willing to look clear-eyed at the past. We certainly uh, have made out our uh, stake here, but uh, it's like people either have forgotten or a lot of people don't want to talk about it, but we're going to talk about it now. So. Yeah. Um, let's talk about um, Arlington House. And mm -hmm. I hear a lot about the Gray family and, you know, how, what's, what's that whole relationship? You know, can you expound on that? Okay, so the, the Arlington House came from the Custis uh, family. Okay. And, um, of course, uh, Mary, uh, Custis married uh, General Lee. So they call it the Lee Mansion, but really it's, it's the Custis uh, family. Um, but, you, but they were uh, the Confederates. And when the Union came in, they left. And it was the Gray family, uh, Selena Gray mostly, who kept all the artifacts and made sure that um, the things that you see today are in place. Uh, she did that. And uh, we know that she, upon her freedom, uh, she was one of the first blacks to ever buy property and bought a whole lot of property in Arlington. And a lot of her family is still uh, living today. A lot, of, a lot of Grays left. Okay, so from Arlington House, let's transition into, transition into Freeman um, Village and right. that, that whole one, that history right. of that and how, right. um, you know, the government created that for, for, for free right. slaves. So the government was trying to build up the Union Army. So uh, the slaves were free here before, um, uh, before Lincoln signed the uh, bill. And so they told if any slaves want to escape here and join the Union, they had safe, uh, a, a, home, a safe place to be. Okay. And um, so a lot of them came here and then they started setting up camps which were in D.C. And there was a lot of disease and these types of things. So the government decided to bring them to Arlington because, you know, Arlington wasn't really developed and it was a lot of fresh air. And we know now with COVID that when you're outside, uh, there's less disease. Mm -hmm. So they set up uh, Freeman's Village on the property uh, at the uh, Arlington House, which was a slap in the face to Lee, because here we are with, <laughs> with this project for black people on, the, on this sort of Confederate uh, property. And uh, the people were only supposed to be there for uh, a couple of years, but we had Freeman's Village for almost 30 years. Yeah. And they would come on, you weren't supposed to stay, You'd come there, you learn how to read, write, uh, you had to work, you could not lay around. Um, there was churches there, hospitals. Uh, matter of fact, Freeman's Hospital out of Howard came from there. Oh, wow. And, um, and these people, when they would come off, they would buy property. And their thing was to learn how to live the American dream, is what they did. Um, with some very famous people that came to teach. Sojourner Truth was one. She actually got paid. Sojourner Truth got a, she wrote a letter to uh, Lincoln and uh, asked could she come here for a couple years. And so she got a stipend. And so her thing was to basically teach uh, black people how to be proud. Because some of these people um, actually got jobs, in government jobs, doing government stuff. So they, 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 they taught you how to be proud, how to, uh, uh, back in those days, they called it being a credit to your race. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so that's what they would teach them. And uh, they didn't just go there and just um, start building. These people had to go to school and learn how to, to even be architects. They, they, some were designers. Um, so uh, everybody, when we see, hear about slave people, you think uh, just working in the fields, but no. They had no, to be smart. They had all kinds of things that they were doing. After that, we talk about Freeman's Village, people come off, then we have the black neighborhoods. Okay. And so the two neighborhoods that really came out of Freeman Village are uh, Green Valley and Johnson Hill. Okay. And then of course, Queen City, which was an all black neighborhood, which is now the uh, Pentagon parking lot. Oh, really? <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> so a lot of things happened here first and then moved down to Virginia. You know, Virginia was, this is where slavery and everything started. Yeah. You hear about 1619 and all that. So it, 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 it's, it's a fight and uh, it's still it's a little bit of a struggle <laughs> even today. Um, just talk about the churches. Like in a black community, churches have really, have really been like, you know, the, the strongholds for, oh, for, yeah. for the community. Yeah. So, you know, 
after Freeman the Village kind of dispersed, mm -hmm. a lot of people stayed because there were strong churches in the community. Mm -hmm. Can you mm -hmm. talk about some of those churches that are still here and people who visit? Right. The, uh, the only one that's not here anymore uh, was uh, First Baptist in Roslyn. Uh, they really were pushed out and they okay. went to D.C. But the other ones that came out of Freeman Village, um, like Lomax and Mount Zion, um, they are still strong. We talked about that neighborhood that was on the, was the Pentagon. Yeah. Well, uh, Mount Olive was the one that bought the property for those people. And the black church was just a light on the community. Like I spoke before, uh, if you needed something, food, or you needed your rent paid or your mortgage paid, they were there to help us. So how does the museum um, really try to foster like the relationship with the younger, with the younger generation and like kind of, um, you know, making sure they don't forget their history and right. where they came from? It's, you know, I, I, had a, I spoke to, to this company, um, uh, I guess, I don't know, the Human Resources wanted somebody to talk about Black, black History Month, because we, we're famous during Black History Month. But uh, they were concerned. A lot of uh, younger uh, uh, black people think that black history is all about slavery. Black history is about coming from something like that and prevail, prevailing. It's, it, you know, it's about having a mountain in your face and learning how to go around it and go above it. And so everybody's trying to get over. Yeah. It's about how to get over. These people had so many things in front of them uh, uh, blocking them, but they managed to get around it, get under it, have families. So um, I think that once people come here and, find, and listen to the stories, they learn how to be triumphant. And I think everybody wants to be, or they should want to be. Yeah, this guy here was my dad's boss. So my, oh. my dad actually was working <laughs> here in this time. And, they t and he told my father, you know, to Jim, before you go home, take off all the stools so nobody would have any place to sit. And my father said, no, I, he can't do it. But they told me going home then. But I, when I first showed dad this picture, he had chills because this was supposed to be his job to do that. Yeah. You know, and he, wow. and. Uh, That's really no seats. <laughs> right. And then these guys, well, this, this, this is from Greensboro. This is where all this type of thing originated from. Mm -hmm. And these, this guy here, this is, this is Dion Diamond. Uh, who was a Howard student. So the black people you see are from Howard. Um, this when did you come on board and when did you become a board member and when did you start working closely with the museum? I think I came in 16 or 17 and it was by mistake. Oh really? I, I, a friend of mine was on the board. We went to school together and she asked me to come to one of the meetings. And I, I'm one of those people that like to ask a lot of questions. I like to share ideas and visions. And next thing I know, um, I'm the chairman <laughs> and president and the chairman or whatever. And, uh, well, you know, it, um, I kind of like saying director pretty much. Yeah. I have a wonderful team that I work with. Uh, everybody has their uh, thing that they do. But it was important to our founder, which was Evelyn Syfax, that we have some actual a visual artifacts, things to look at. So um, where we were, they were using it as an office. And I sort of got rid of everybody and said, no, we're gonna have some exhibits in here. And um, I, so we've been lucky to have uh, a lot of uh, important people come, schools come mm -hmm. by, you guys. So uh, I'm just very thankful about it, but I, I wanna keep growing, I wanna keep growing. That's our show. Thank you for your support. And remember to always follow your art. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.